Okay, hi. Uh, my name is Joe Caldwell, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about the work we did on reducing calling convention overhead for object-oriented programs on ARM, embedded ARM platforms. So, uh, an overview. First, I'm going to introduce what the, the problem is. I'm going to talk about how bad the problem is in sort of uh, real-world software. And then I'll be going over the optimization method that we developed and an evaluation of, of that method. So, to introduce, uh, I, uh, before I started this research, I used to do a job where I was doing a lot of embedded programming. So we were writing, writing code, C and C++ code, uh, for these very, very tiny microcontrollers, very small, very cheap, um, that generally had uh, very little flash space. So on the order of, you know, a few hundred kilobytes, for example, uh, and also very cheap. Um, and basically, as time went on, the more development work we did, eventually, well, we just used up all of our flash space. Our, our code was using all of it up. If we needed to add any features, we needed to find some way of shrinking what we already had before we could add anything new. Uh, and this ended up taking most of our time, and so it was kind of a kind of a big problem. We ended up getting really good at looking at assembly code and trying to figure out, like, why is this taking up so much space, that sort of thing. Uh, and we really wanted to have, uh, you know, a, a more automated method of doing this. That would have been really nice. Uh, we also had a bit of an intuition that object-oriented programs uh, were producing bigger binaries. Uh, for a whole bunch of reasons, uh, but uh, this wasn't entirely clear. And of course, we, you know, we in, in the embedded world, you know, we're we're still stuck sort of behind the times in programming. A lot of things are still done in C. We wanted to use C++, but it was sort of nagging at us that like, are, are we just going to be killing ourselves, shooting ourselves in the foot, making our binaries bigger when we don't have enough space? So we wanted to investigate this. Uh, and so that's just uh, just an example of the sort of processors we were working with. Occurs to me suddenly I probably should have uh, switched that diagram to be in dollars, but uh, the the price goes up really quickly as you get more flash space, so it, and the size also go, gets bigger. Uh, making trying to get binary small really important in this field. So that's like uh, two dollars and twenty cents up to three dollars and sixty cents for the big one. So what can we do about this? Where can we save splash, flash space in these microcontroller programs? So to go through the, the problem I looked into, I'm going to walk through sort of an example compilation of this really, really simple C function into the ARM assembly language. So don't worry too much if you're not familiar with ARM. Uh, so I'll start out with sort of a, a skeleton assembly of what this function would look like. Obviously in this function we have two calls, one to foo, one to bar. We add up the results. So we see those in the assembly. We have two jumps and an add instruction and a return at the end. Uh, on the ARM instruction set, and in particular the thumb2 uh, mode of the ARM instruction set, uh, each of these instructions takes up two bytes. So if we can get rid of some of these instructions, we can save some space. There are also four byte instructions. Uh, for the purposes of my examples, I'm only going to be dealing with two byte instructions. If you are familiar with assembly programming, you might notice that that add instruction is missing registers. We need some registers to operate on here. Uh, but which registers are we going to use? To, to know, to figure out which registers to use, we need some sort of convention for this. So here is a sort of simplified version of the ARM calling convention. So it says that when we pass arguments to procedures, uh, our arguments are going to be in those first four registers, R0, R1, R2, and R3. Return values will be in R0. We're not allowed to change uh, the first four registers in any procedure calls. Um, Sorry, we are allowed to change those. We are not allowed to change uh, any of the other registers. So that's what we're working with. So from that, uh, that calling convention, we can see that our variables A and B are going to be in the first two registers, R0 and R1. And when we call foo and bar, uh, A is going to need to be in R0, and B is also going to need to be in R0, because they're both the first, the first parameter. Uh, so immediately we can see an obvious problem. B is at some point going to move. It's in the wrong register. Uh, but before we can deal with that problem, there's actually another problem, uh, which is that when we call foo, foo is allowed to change the value of R1, which means we need to somehow save B uh, before we can call foo. So I'm going to add in a little move instruction to move B into a register that we're not going to change in foo. And then after we call foo, uh, I'm going to put the return, uh, the, the return value somewhere again safe uh, so that we make room in R0 for B. Then I'll throw in a move instruction again to move B into the instruction into the uh, register it's supposed to be. Now we can call bar, and now we know what uh, what registers to use for add. And it looks something like this. 
And then this is mostly done. This is mostly our compiled function. Uh, we've added uh, four, uh, sorry, three move instructions. There's one other thing we have to do, though. Uh, our con our uh, calling convention says that we're not allowed to change certain registers. We can't change R4 and R5, for instance, but we've been changing them. So we need to save them on the stack and restore them at the end. And here is our final uh, compiled function. And so the point, of course, I want to make here is, well, there's a lot, of, a lot of instructions going on here that aren't really doing any useful work. They're just moving things around in registers. And uh, those take up a lot of space. In fact, more than half of this function is just wasted by move instructions and saving stuff on the stack and, and that sort of thing. And we'd like to get rid of this if we could. Of course, we'll never be able to get rid of all of it, but we can maybe, we can maybe do something about this. Uh, now, that said, uh, that was obviously a very contrived example. I've come up with that example to make this problem look just horrible. You know, 50% of your programs are just, just moving things around. And of course, that's not really true. We, we had no idea how bad this problem was in real software. So our, our first task was just to kind of see how, how bad is this actually in real programs. Uh, so we came up with an analysis tool that basically just runs through a binary uh, and makes some judgment on each instruction on whether an instruction is part of calling convention overhead or isn't. This is not necessarily clear. Uh, some instructions are clearly part of this overhead that we're defining. Uh, some of it's are a little bit a little bit vaguer. Uh, you know, sometimes if, uh, for example, a function is register starved, it's not necessarily clear whether the starvation is causing additional moves or whether the calling convention is calling additional moves, that sort of thing. Uh, but we made what we think are sort of reasonable judgments in these cases uh, to come up with some some estimates uh, on how bad this problem is. So here are a bunch, of, uh, a bunch of software programs that we ran through our analysis tool. Uh, most of them are open source C and C++ programs that were intended for these ARM microcontrollers that we were working with. Uh, so it's not just general programs, it's specifically embedded programs. Uh, so presumably the developers of these programs have at least given some thought to optimizing it for their platform. We're not just you know, throwing them at a platform they were never intended to. Uh, a few of these programs are from industry. Uh, and basically what we discovered is in these programs, on average, about 8% of the instructions in these programs were uh, what we thought of as calling convention overhead. We can break it down a little bit further. Some of these programs are in C, some of these are C++, some of them are mixed. Uh, and we found that, yeah, the, uh, the, the rate in C++ programs does seem to be higher. We found about 10% on average in C++ programs and 7% on average in C programs. This is kind of a small sample size. Uh, but it gives us uh, some hint as to, as to uh, how the results are, are going to fall. Uh, we also looked at sort of some specific code patterns that influence this. Uh, so for instance, if you've got a function with a lot of arguments, obviously you're increasing the chances that registers are not going to be in the places they're supposed to be. It doesn't necessarily mean they aren't. The compiler is fairly clever at trying to put values in the right registers, but it can't always do it, so that's increasing your odds. Uh, something as simple as uh, constructing an object and passing it as an argument. Uh, I mean, this is, this is pretty standard stuff here, uh, but the problem is the way, the way this is implemented, uh, at least in this platform, is that constructors are implemented sort of as a void function, so they don't return anything. So the, value, the, the pointer to the object you just constructed is no longer in the register you want it to be, so we end up adding a couple of move instructions to save and restore it. A uh, similar situation happens just if you construct an object on the stack uh, and then call a function on it. We end up with an extra move instruction that maybe we don't want. It's a little better in that case. Uh, adjacent function calls. In this case, um, I mean, again, similar to the previous example, you're losing that pointer each time, so you always need to restore it. And also, if you just have a lot of function calls next to each other, you're sort of not giving the compiler any opportunity to move things around in between, since it just has to jump from one call to the next. You're not giving it any sort of arithmetic that it can cleverly rearrange where the results go and that sort of thing uh, to put things in the correct registers. Uh, and again, uh, just, just passing, passing a return value in something that isn't the first argument is always going to end up with extra move instructions. In the case of C++, the, uh, the list pointer in this case is the first argument, so even though get foo looks like it's in the first argument, it's sort of the second from the, the binary's point of view. The point I really want to make is, I mean, this isn't bad code or anything. This is perfectly normal, perfectly good code. Um, people who come out of school, you know, learning how to code are very good programmers, get into this microcontroller space. Uh, you know, th they're, not, uh, they're not taught to like avoid these kind of things. But this is perfectly normal code. This should be good stuff. There are things you can do uh, at the programming language level 
to get around some of these problems, but you end up with really ugly code that doesn't make much sense. Uh, you start to have to worry about the context you're calling a function in uh, while you're writing the function, which sort of breaks separation of concern. You know, that's not a good solution. We wanted something a little bit more general than this. Uh, and we also looked at language influence a little bit, a little bit more. Uh, obviously, in the, in the previous graph I showed, uh, C++ programs look like they have a bit more overhead, but that's not an apples to apples comparison. I mean, these are completely different programs. It's hard to compare just any old C program with any old C++ program. We wanted to do a little bit better than that. Uh, so we wrote uh, a couple of synthetic programs that perform exactly the same task, and we tried to really stick to idiomatic C for the C program and idiomatic C++ for the C++ program. Take that with a grain of salt. I mean, my, my impression of what an idiomatic C++ program is is certainly up for debate. Uh, but that it was a bit better than just comparing two completely dissimilar programs, though. Uh, and, you know, again, we came up with a lot more overhead in the C++ version than the C version. So this gives us a bit more confidence in combined with our previous results that, yeah, you know, something about C++ programs are making this problem a little bit worse. It's not necessarily C++ language features per se. I don't necessarily mean to put blame on C++. Uh, I think, you know, personally my opinion is this seems to come more from programmer style. If you're writing from, if you're writing object-oriented programs, you're probably just going to have more function calls in general, which is going to make this pro problem a little bit worse. Not necessarily anything in particular to do with C++. Um, so in general, this is, a, this is a significant problem in real world programs. It's a little bit worse than C++ programs, so what can we actually do about it? Uh, so we have a few, a few existing options. If we just want to get rid of uh, calling convention overhead and we're worried about performance, we're worried about speed, well, function inlining will basically solve this problem for you in a lot of cases. Uh, but it's not going to help you if you're concerned about code size, which we are in the microcontroller space. So, uh, so for example, if you tell GCC to optimize for size, it's going to just disable function inlining entirely. Uh, so that's not a very good solution in our space. Uh, this is sort of a big space, you know, uh, compiler optimizations have quite a long history. Uh, but just to briefly talk about them, there's interprocedural register allocation which is to say, get rid of calling conventions entirely, just allocate all of the registers in the whole program globally. As you can imagine, that's pretty expensive. And even for small programs, it takes a really long time. Uh, so it's, it's not generally been done. There are a, a few kind of tricks to make it a little bit cheaper, but those work a lot better if you have a lot of registers to play with, which we tend not to in these embedded controller spaces. There are also some peephole optimizations that have been developed that can, in some cases, uh, get rid of the calling convention overhead, uh, but only in really special cases, and they're not really general solutions. We wanted to try to come up with something a little bit general. Uh, so what we've come up with is a binary-to-binary -binary optimizer, uh, which takes uh, ELF binary files uh, with some debugging information and uses that to rewrite them to get rid of some of this, this overhead. Uh, in theory, we could also integrate this into the compiler, and that would actually uh, improve things uh, a little bit. Uh, but for our purposes, it was a little easier, easier for us to implement it this way, just to sort of prove the concept, see if this is going to work. And we have a prototype implementation of this. So basically, the idea is, well, we, we take this, this same, uh, same function I had before. If we can maybe change the convention of these two functions uh, individually, we're not using the same con uh, convention everywhere, well, we can make it a lot smaller. I mean, that looks great. That's a lot smaller. Uh, but how, does this, how well does this actually work in practice is the question. So there's a, a number of challenges here. Um, uh, producing a good calling conventions uh, at, at first seemed a lot easier than register allocation, but as it turns out, this basically reduces to the same problem of uh, register allocation, which is an NP-complete problem. And when you're trying to do that over the entire program, this is not, not very good, not very efficient. We also wanted something that was a little bit more general. We didn't want to do just a bunch of peephole optimizations. Uh, and our implementation, at least, because it's going from binary to binary, uh, needs to be able to understand already optimized code. We were taking uh, optimized for size, uh, primarily GCC optimized for size programs, trying to interpret them and rewrite them. Uh, and sometimes GCC does some, some pretty weird things in an attempt to gain you know, slight performance advantages. So our, our, uh, our program needed to, needed to be able to handle this. Uh, so from a, a high-level view, basically what we do is we construct this, this sort of abstract model of a function based on the assembly code. And we try to put instructions into this model, which uh, is non-trivial because uh, the instructions aren't necessarily in a, a perfectly reasonable order. 
We like to put things into a prologue and an epilogue, for instance, but GCC will sometimes put a, some of the prologue a little bit later to get some, some slight performance advantages and things like that. So we put it into this abstract model, and we try to make, uh, we try to apply these specific fixed strategies, uh, fixed transformations onto this model uh, to change some of the, uh, change some of the calling conventions in very regular ways, or we can sort of predict uh, what this is going to do without sort of, um, you know, messing up everything in a, in a difficult to predict way. Uh, it's a fairly simple idea, but it, it still did produce some, some good results for us. Um, so basically what the method would do is it would, for instance, look at what we call this call prologue, which is basically the set of move instructions that would be immediately before our procedure call, uh, that would sort of, you know, move a value from one register to another. And we would say, well, gee, you know, we could get rid of this instruction if maybe we could change this calling convention from one convention to another. Uh, and then, uh, so for example, we might say, can we, can we change that, that first argument to R4? Um, so to give you an example of how this works in practice, a really simple example. Trouble with, uh, with doing examples with assembly is that you've got to kind of keep the assembly real short and it's hard to see the, the full complexity, but this gives us a start anyway. So for instance, we've got these two functions, foo and bar, and our optimizer will look at this and say, hey, well maybe we can change the convention of foo uh, so that its first parameter is R4 instead of R0. So our first step, we can modify some of these move instructions. If we modify these two move instructions, well, they're, they're redundant. And so we can get rid of them, and hey, this is a great optimization. We've saved four bytes. So emboldened by our previous success, well, maybe we can, we can change parameter two to R6. This didn't work quite as well. We were able to get one of these move instructions. Uh, the other move instruction we had to modify, but we're still saving two bytes. This is still good. So maybe we'll try uh, changing the third parameter to R3. This didn't work quite as well. We were able to eliminate one instruction in bar, but we had to add an instruction in foo in order to make this work. So this maybe wasn't a good, a good, uh, a good transformation, but we have a strategy we can try. So we'll get rid of that and we'll try something else. We can instead apply register renaming. So instead of trying to fiddle with the prologues, we can just go through the entire function and rename all instances of one register to another. So if we try that, well, this looks good. We've gotten rid of, of one instruction. We had to modify another instruction. But it doesn't work unless we also go through and modify uh, this other procedure call to function grew down here, because it was expecting a value to be in R2. We modified it to R3. Uh, so what this method will do is it will recursively go through functions and then try this process again on grew and say, well, can we, can we apply this, this change to grew without making grew uh, so big as to negate the benefit gotten. Uh, so that's the general idea. We're not doing any sort of uh, register application. We're just applying certain fixed strategies that have sort of very predictable, very known results. Um, obviously, this can get a whole lot more complicated if you have multiple functions calling, uh, multiple callers for the same function, which is sort of our default case. You don't usually have a function unless you're going to have at least two things calling it. Otherwise, there isn't necessarily a point in making it a function in the first place, except possibly just for organization reasons. And we can get into, you know, recursive calls, and there's a whole number of things that really throw a loophole at our sort of simple strategies. Uh, but we have, we have solutions to, to go through those. I'm not going to get into them in too much detail. Uh, so how did, this actually, how did this actually work out in the real world? Uh, so for C programs, basically, we were able to get rid of about 10% of the calling convention overhead. Uh, which isn't particularly good. C, C programs uh, in general only had about 7% overhead in total. So if you get rid of 10% of the 7%, this is, this is a pretty low amount. Uh, but we did a lot better on C++ programs. We were able to get 27% of the overall uh, overhead removed. And C++ programs had more overhead to begin with. Um, so they had about 10% overhead on average. So this gets us about a 2.7% optimization on average. It's not a huge optimization. I was a little bit disappointed, actually. I was hoping I could get, you know, maybe up to 5% or something. Uh, but we got about 2.7% 2, 2 uh, with, with a fairly simple method, I think. This, this guy, even, even such a simple method uh, does get us some positive results. Uh, and it also sort of reveals that while C++ programs have more overhead, the overhead they have is also easier to optimize. So wherever this extra overhead comes in C++ programs, uh, it's more easily removable by simple methods like this, which is interesting. It's not the same kind of overhead that we see in C programs. We also tried this on the synthetic programs we created. 
Uh, I'm going to go through this pretty quick. But uh, basically, those same synthetic programs we created where we tried to have an idiomatic C program and an idiomatic C++ program that were doing the same things. Uh, and again, we were able to uh, get rid of a lot more of the overhead on the C++ program than the C program, which again just gives us extra confidence that yeah, the, the C++ programs are more easily optimizable than the C programs, in addition to having more overhead to start with. Uh, so that's my uh, presentation. I will uh, happily take any questions.